grace and love for us, respond to them, and leave changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, good morning again, and welcome to Chancellor Church. If you slipped in just over the last couple minutes, if you're new here, make sure you do check out the uh, red table over there. We've got some a little bit of welcome packs and uh, people there ready to chat about some of the whys behind what we do here. If you have questions about our church and things like that, and, and do make sure you stick around for a cup of tea and a bicky after the service as well, just over there. We'd love to be able to catch up and chat and, and meet you uh, as well. This morning, we're going to... Um, We're going to be jumping into our last week looking at the book of Jonah, where we've been kind of making our way through this book, looking at the idea of God's surprising mercy, the kind of surprising mercy that we actually find in its pages, and so that we kind of can become the type of people who show mercy as we should, as God our Father would have us do. Uh, And through this kind of journey, we've been looking at the prophet Jonah, the disobedient prophet Jonah, who God told him to go east, east to Nineveh to preach a message of judgment against the Ninevites, and he hightailed it and went west. Uh, But God, through his great mercy and a whale, a big great fish or a whale, as a popular story is make it out, uh, and a discipline of a storm kind of brought Jonah back to his senses, and he eventually did obey God, and he went to Nineveh and preached a message. um, And people there, we, uh, we learnt they relented. They, they changed their way. They repented. And God, by looking at what they did, repented. Uh, he kind of, they were looking at their repentance and they, he relented, I should say, from the judgment he was going to give them. Uh, and we, we see this all amazing picture of mercy from Jonah, mercy for Nineveh, and this whole kind of story. And it almost seems like it's the end of the story of Jonah, doesn't it? Uh, after that, we kind of Cover the ground, it seems that the Jonah was disobedient. He started to write. People responded to God. Everybody's happy and smiley. Yeah, that's kind of how it all ends. At least that's kind of how my, uh, the kid's picture Bible at home puts it. It always misses out chapter four. But if we do the same as adults and teens in this room today, uh, we're going to miss the, the big point of the whole story of Jonah. We miss out on some of the answers that we've kind of been facing, faced and and wondering about for the last couple chapters. Uh, And we'll also miss out on a real and clear picture of mercy in chapter four, especially that we, I think we desperately need to see. And I know I need to see at times. Uh, Because mercy, if we're honest, as we'll see in chapter four today, can be a bit of a a problematic issue. Uh, Mercy as in compassion or love for someone in a spot which is hard and you kind of take pity on that kind of thing can sometimes be a little bit confusing to know how and when and why and all that. It can seemingly cause more problems at time. If you show mercy to a criminal, for example, won't they just go out and do it again? If you show mercy to a child, won't they, you know, think they can get away with everything? If you, and worse yet, if you show mercy, does that mean justice doesn't occur? Justice is a bit of a funny thing for us modern people. I think sometimes we're a little bit embarrassed by the concept. Surely as a society, we're forgiving enough and merciful enough that we wouldn't think of locking people up or anything like that or punishing. It's a bit beyond us. That is, of course, until, you know, you're driving along and someone cuts you off in traffic, yeah, and nobody was there to see it. Where's the police when you need them, right? Or more seriously, when you look at the atrocities of the wars going on around the place, or look at some of the corruption in the governments that we have in this world, or worse yet, when your own family or child has crimes made against them and committed against them, and they're hurt and vulnerable, we want justice. But how can we have justice if we're meant to be the type of people who show mercy? Surely mercy should be about, you know, letting people go free and forgiving them and treating better than they they deserve. But surely that is to the detriment of justice. This tension is, I think, why often we want to want to have mercy and justice on our own terms, yeah? Because they, they, they're important to us. They're so important to us, we're, we're afraid to let them go. It's hard to trust them with someone else. And this is ultimately what we've been seeing in the picture of Jonah as well. But we'll see today that justice and mercy are better in the hands of God than of little old you and me. In fact, he will bring about the justice and mercy that we desire better than we could ourselves. I'll say that again. God will bring about the justice and mercy that we desire better than we can ourselves. And that has a lot of implications. 
So let's get stuck into chapter four this morning as we have a look at the last chapter and the last bit of Jonah. So move there, chapter four, it's at the end of the Old Testament, uh, in some of the little minor prophets, and we're going to be looking, uh, beginning out with verses one to five. Now, last week, we, in the book of Jonah, finished off on this wonderfully amazing note in ch- verse 10 of chapter three. And what it said was this, when God saw what they did, and this is Nineveh, the evil Ninevites, right? When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil way, God relented of that disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Now you might think that Jonah, in light of this, would be really happy about this. You know, he, he, they kind of turned from the evil way, they got rid of their violence, God, and, and, and they kind of, you know, made a big change, and God would even use some, him for doing such a task. But instead, what we read in verse 1 is this, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. More literally, at his heart level, he felt that it was exceedingly evil to him that God would show this kind of mercy and relent from showing this disaster. It reminds us of the older brother from the the prodigal son story that Jesus told, yeah? The younger brother, he goes away, he does bad things, he realizes all the things he's done, he returns in repentance, and his father comes running out to him and shows him mercy. And then we read at the end of the story, the older brother who stayed there the whole time angry and bitter at the mercy that God had showed at the mercy that the father had showed to the younger brother it takes a special type of self-centeredness and arrogance doesn't it to to get angry about someone else receiving mercy but that's what we see here just where God's anger cooled off Jonah's anger started burning due to God's mercy and so he takes his prayer to God And he says this, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Excuse me. Ah. Now, now we finally, in these kind of verses here, we finally get to see the reason for Jonah fleeing in chapter one. Remember in chapter one, we didn't have an idea why he chose to flee. We're kind of wondering about it. But now here, finally in chapter four, it is revealed to us why he finally fled. And it was because of God being a God who shows mercy. I don't know if you've ever worked in customer service before, but I have. When I was younger, I remember being on the floor of a department store, uh, floor selling things like I did, and I was dealing with a customer, and I was dealing for, for a little bit trying to figure out exactly what they needed, and someone else rocked up and immediately demanded my attention. Now, I wasn't able to give it to them because I was dealing with another customer at the time, and so I kind of was like, oh, not, not yet. Anyway, this customer, not very long after I said I wasn't able to deal with them right now, went to my boss and complained to my boss about me, and then I... I got in trouble, and the reason for on my record, employment record at the time, was for being nice, for not being rude, for not bailing on a customer. It's very interesting to have that on your employment record. But I, I kind of see this is the same thing which goes on here in this story. It, and Jonah, Jonah complains about God for being full of grace and mercy to the Assyrians. How, how weird is that? You would have thought that he would have understood by now, knowing Jonah, this disobedient prophet who's been shown so much mercy already. But he doesn't. So why the issue? Well, the issue seems to be that if he shows mercy to the Assyrians, well, you know what Jonah's thinking? They're just going to take that mercy, turn around, and come straight back at us and attack us and kill us and destroy us. Here God finally has the perfect opportunity to break them, to destroy them, to bring justice on these people who are known for being evil and who would basically invade Israel given any chance. And instead of delivering justice, Jonah's thinking God here is just letting them go. Let them get away with it. God seems to care to Jonah more about the Assyrians than his own people who he's made commitments and promises to. How does that work? And so Jonah is angry. He sees God's mercy leading to injustice and his own people suffering. He sees God's character is out of whack. 
not, it's all mercy and no justice. And so jo- Jonah puts all of his cards on the table in verse 3, and he says, this is my hill to die for, die on, you know. Therefore, O Lord, please take my life for, for me. It is better for me to live than to die. If God is going to show mercy in such a way to peoples like these, pff, I am better off dead. And he puts this to God almost in a way where he may be trying to convince God, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. This is better for me to be dead. Why would you do this to inflict this upon me, God? Surely, surely, just like you relented on showing disaster to Nineveh and those evil Assyrians, surely you could relent on the mercy you showed as well, yeah? But the image that Jonah has of God here, is that an accurate image? Is he all mercy and no justice, letting people get away with things? It's interesting when you look at what Jonah says in verse 2. When speaking about God's compassion and grace, his great complaint to God, he actually quotes from the Bible. And he's quoting from Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7. But he has one major omission. Have a look at these two quotes on the screen for me. One is from Jonah and one is from Exodus. And what we see here is Jonah takes this text from Exodus and kind of summarizes it and condenses it down but he twists it in such a way that he misses out showing that God is the one full of justice. Have a look here in the underlined section here. And there it says uh, in Exodus that God will by no means clear the guilty. But for Jonah, he just sees all mercy. His picture of God is faulty. Now, whether he really believed that God is not full of justice, considering the fact that he was just literally thrown into the the sea, as we saw in the last couple chapters, for doing the wrong thing, right? That's, that's a bit of a de- up debate. But regardless of what he thinks, it's how he feels. He feels God is not just. He sees God being more bent on mercy and doesn't care much about justice. But it's not true. Here from God's mouth in Exodus, he is full of mercy and full of justice. The issue isn't that Jonah has here, isn't whether God is full of mercy or justice. That's, that's pretty settled in the Bible. It's whether he trusts God to bring justice. It's whether he trusts God with mercy. It's whether he trusts God. And so God responds to this prayer of Jonah's, his prayer of complaint, but not in wrath like Jonah Jonah would have him respond to like the Ninevites and as he actually responded to disobedient prophets in the past. No, he doesn't respond in wrath. Rather, he asks a question in verse four. He says this, do you do well to be angry? God cuts to the chase. Is that reaction that you're having, Jonah, is that good? We know all of our actions and our emotions kind of flow from our heart, according to the Bible. So God really here is looking deeper. He's probing Jonah to self-examination. Look at how you're behaving right now. What's going on in your heart? And from what we can see as readers, his heart is full of idols, just like the Ninevites that he did not like, just like the boat people in the boat that he did not like, the seamen. Jonah has two clear idols, I think we can see. The first is himself. He doesn't trust God's way of doing things. He sees justice and mercy are better off in his own hands. He wants the Bible according to Jonah. He wants nations ruled according to Jonah. It's in Jonah whom Jonah trusts, yeah? And the second, I think, his other idol is his own nation. He sees that his nation's protection possible protection from the evil Assyrians. He sees that is of more value and a greater value than to him than to actually following God's ways. He puts nation over God. Is it good that Jonah should be angry here? All it does is highlight his sinfulness and his idolatry. And is that that question that Jonah again, like in chapter one, we saw silently in verse five, walks away. He walks out of, the, uh, out of the city east, which in the Bible, often when you go east, is associated with kind of going away from God's plans and purposes. And he sets up a little shelter or a little booth for himself to watch, um, excuse me, watch what will actually become of the city. 
You see, Jonah is still in verse 5, is bent on thinking that he's actually right. He seemingly thinks that Ninevites might end up showing God their true colors and God will like, oh, mate, done. I'm going to destroy these people. Look what they've done. They've changed their mind so quickly. Or he might be thinking that God might change his mind based on the fact that he said he was going to die. You know, he's not even worth living. Either way, he stubbornly sits there outside the city, watching the city, waiting for thousands and thousands and thousands of people to die. And seeing what will happen. And it's here that God uses as an opportunity to teach Jonah one last lesson in this book. And it involves a plant, a worm, and some wind. Which just adds more reasons probably why the kids' picture Bibles do miss this last chapter, yeah? It's all very bizarre. So what's going on? Well, firstly, Jonah creates for himself a little shelter in verse 5 as he watches what's going to happen to the city. But evidently, it's, it's, it's not a very good shelter. And so God, in his mercy, he, he goes along and he appoints a plant. And this plant grows up really quickly. And it's a nice shady tree for Jonah to sit underneath. And he's all happy and smiley. Uh, and the disaster or bad spot he was in is no longer in his mind. He is happy. And God does this to kind of save Jonah from his situation, despite all that Jonah has done. And he's overjoyed. But however, in the next day, at dawn in verse 7, God appoints a worm, which in the Bible has a lot of symbolism with judgment, right? And it attacks like a soldier, when you look at the Hebrew, attacks this plant and the plant withers. And so Jonah loses his wonderful shady plant. And then the day just gets hotter and hotter. The sun's rising. And so God at this time appoints a wind and it brings dry and hot air and it makes that situation worse and worse. And so Jonah describes himself feeling faint and starts asking again that he might die. And I thought my youngest daughter was a drama queen. And on this request, Jonah asks again, uh, sorry, God answers Jonah's frustration and asking for death. He God asks again, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Again, a self-examination question. What's happening at the heart level here for Jonah? And what we can see, it's, it seems to be that Jonah at first received mercy for the plant. He didn't do anything right. He was actually in a bad relationship with God, but God showed mercy to him. So the plant was an act of mercy to him, providing shade to relieve him from the horrible conditions he was in, right? But then the worm and the wind came, and it showed that God was taking away this mercy, and he was attacked like he hoped Nineveh would be attacked. And Jonah received the, the judgment that he wanted on other people. And he did not like it. He was upset because mercy was taken away from him. And he experienced judgment as a result. So at, at his heart level, Jonah seems upset because of the lack of mercy shown to him. How ironic is that? And Jonah states to God, yes. Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And God responds again in mercy, calmly it seems, explaining the point of this weird, bizarre little story of the plant and the wind and the worm. And he says this in verse 10 and 11. You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came to, into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? You see, Jonah wanted mercy. He felt what it was like to receive judgment through the worm and the wind, and he saw the pain that was part of that situation and saw he needed mercy and should be shown of it based upon the situation that he was in. And God agreed. He doesn't dismiss that claim of Jonah, but rather asks, and should I not pity Nineveh, therefore? Which in the Hebrew is a rhetorical question. Should I not pity Nineveh based upon all this? Because for Jonah, he did not think Nineveh needed to be showed mercy. 
Nineveh, that place full of huge numbers of people who comparatively to Jonah did not know God's word and therefore were, did not have a proper understanding of how things should be, didn't know their right hand from their left hand. These same people and also much cattle, since Jonah is so apparently worried about plants here, should they not too show, be, be shown mercy? How does that work? Jonah should, one guy should be shown verse, mercy versus 120,000 people. God's the one guy who knows how to behave versus the people who don't. He should get mercy, yeah? God's point is that he wants to show mercy to both Jonah and Nineveh. Should God give Nineveh mercy? That's how this book ends. It's asking whether we agree with that statement. It kind of finishes right there. It's really quite anticlimactic, but it's a lot, a lot more important than we realize. That question has a host of implications. Should God give Nineveh mercy? And the question is for us as readers to this book is how are we going to respond to that? How are we going to respond to God's question? Do we agree with him? What should we do? How would we finish that sentence? Well, from this chapter and in this book, I think there are two ways, two ways that I can come up with right now that, that I think we should respond to this story. The first way is this, that I think we should respond to this story in chapter four by trusting God when he shows mercy. That's how I think we should respond firstly. I think we have all been a bit of a Jonah at times, haven't we? When it seems someone is getting uh, away with something, we react. And we don't trust, you know, the, the proper processes to bring justice in our society or things like that. Uh, no, they're, they're probably not going to work, we think. Rather, we take justice often into our own hands, doing what should be done. That person, they had it coming. But really, all we're doing is showing vengeance. Now, often movies play on this kind of plot line, right? You know, well, okay, action movies at least anyway, right? There's a guy and he takes well, all his assassination skills and military skills and he goes off to bring justice on, I don't know, vengeance on people who killed the dog like in John Wick or something like that, right? Um, and often there's typically a scene in those movies where they kind of, there's like a, hey, you probably shouldn't be doing this. Don't bring, ju don't bring vengeance. And often like secular movies, the way in which they kind of explain why you shouldn't do this yourself is, I don't know, like... It will eat you up if you do this or it will harm your mental health or you'll change who you are forever or something like that, which I'm sure is a bit true. Uh, but the Bible actually gives a better reason. Paul says in Romans 12, 19 this, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. We are not told to avenge because uh, we are not told to avenge not because mercy should only be the thing shown uh, and no justice, but rather because God is actually going to bring justice. We are meant to trust Him that He's actually going to bring it about. We can trust God when He shows mercy. As I said at the beginning of, of today, God will bring about the justice and mercy that we desire better than we could ourselves. But the question is, how does that work out for Jonah? Because you know what? Jonah was actually right. God showed mercy to Nineveh. And do you know what happened a few years later? Nineveh invaded in, with Assyria, Israel. They took the northern kingdom away. You can read all about it in 2 Kings 17. They destroyed them. They bound them all up and took them and shipped them into their own country. If God had acted during uh, Jonah's time, Nineveh would have been brought to ruin, and who knows? Maybe that huge crisis could have all been averted. However, interestingly, fast forward a, a few decades after that, as we're going to find out after Easter, as Rodney goes through Nahum, God also brings justice and judgment and destroys Nineveh too. He brought justice in the end, but it actually took some time for it to happen. In fact, we read in, in 2 Kings 17 uh, about the destruction of Israel. We also see that God used these Assyrians, these Ninevites, to bring justice to Israel as well for the crimes they were committing continually against God. That went on for many, many years. God can be trusted to show mercy. Justice will come about whether it's for, on his own people or others. And however it may, though, as we look at this, 
come about in strange ways. And not immediately at times, it seems. 2 Peter 3, 9 to 10 illustrates this well and provides some hints for us how to, how to resolve this kind of complexity. He says this in 2 Peter, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Perhaps the justice we long for in our lives is slow, because God is wanting none to perish, but all to have time to turn to him. Just like the Ninevites, just like with Jonah, and just like with ourselves. Because God is bent on mercy. And I mean bent on it. I think we can see in the book of Jonah that God is almost, it's almost as if God delights to show mercy more than the destruction of people. That is not to say that God is not full of justice. We saw that from Exodus 34. He will by no means clear the guilty, right? But he is also full of mercy. Theologians call this the uh, simplicity of God. And they kind of describe this to be able to deal with lots of these different characteristics of God. God is not someone full of different parts. And you kind of make up like a pizza, right? And here's his justice part and here's his merciful part and here's his loving part and all that kind of stuff. No, rather God is completely and simply completely fully to the perfect extent each of his attributes when we say that god is full of mercy he is the god of mercy that is who he is that is no we know who he is to the fullest extent perfectly done when he, we say he is full of justice he is full of justice to the perfect extent completely and utterly when he is full of power he is full, fully powerful he is a god of power and so forth like that to say otherwise would reduce who god is but as we read in second peter he doesn't wish that any should perish as well, though, as Jonathan Edwards says when kind of reflecting on a few of these themes, he says this, God has no pleasure in the destruction or the calamity of persons or people. He had rather they should turn and continue in peace. He is well pleased if they forsake their evil ways, that he may not have occasion to execute his wrath upon them. He is a God that delights in mercy and judgment is his strange work. Not that God would not bring judgment, but from the Bible, it seems that almost as if it's God's mercy is his natural reaction. If you could possibly catch God off guard right and surprise him, Dane Altland says this, his natural reaction that leaps freely from him is blessing, the impulse to good, the desire to swallow us up with joy. This is what I think we can see in the book of Jonah. God's heart coming to display as he shows his desire to show mercy on the helpless situation of the Ninevites, those helpless people not knowing their right from their left. But as 2 Peter 3.10 says, while God is bent on mercy, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, even if it will take time. God will bring about the justice that is required in this sinful world. Do not give up hope. In fact, God is so serious about justice. He is so serious about justice, he even shows justice and brings it about on those whom he has showed mercy to as well. And we see this what and we see this especially as we come into Holy Week, which as we've already pointed out is today, the beginning of Palm Sunday. It was on Palm Sunday that Jesus, the Son of God who took on flesh, and lived amongst us on mission from God, rode into a city ruled by Romans. He didn't go on a big war horse to take back what was his and bring justice to the oppression that the Romans had on his people, nor did he bring, go on a big a war horse to bring justice to, on his own people who had carried on in their evil and corrupt ways for so many years. No, he came like the king of Nineveh from chapter 3, without all the robes of splendor. He came in humility riding a donkey. And it was later on in that week, those very people that he showed this humility and mercy to and compassion to, both Jews and Gentiles, they stripped him, they nailed him, they put him on a cross to die for crimes he did not commit. But in, it was in this travesty of injustice that God brought about his justice and his mercy together perfectly. You see, it was on the cross that Jesus would bear the punishment that was required for those who sinned against God. 
But Jesus never sinned. Rather, it was the sin of, sins of others that were placed upon him on that cross, that he took upon himself and he died in their place to satisfy God's just wrath towards people who've committed crimes against him, while at the same time extending mercy and forgiveness to those same very people, the people who were deserving of death. It's at the cross that we see the questions of mercy and justice, the questions that Jonah had resolved meaning that God can be bent on showing mercy without the accusation of being called unjust. God will bring about justice and mercy that we desire better than we could ourselves. And so we can trust God when he shows mercy. We do not have to take vengeance into our own hands. We don't have to grumble and complain when others are rece uh, receiving mercy, not ourselves or things they, we think they shouldn't be receiving mercy for. We can trust him that, that when people are unjustly hurting us. We can trust him when people are unjustly slandering us. We can trust him that he will bring justice about. We can see that when he returns in judgment. And we can even see that when he brings and shows mercy on the cross. We can trust God when he shows mercy. Response number two to how I think we should respond to this story. We too should show mercy. For the past two weeks, I've been saying we've been looking at the story of Jonah to see the surprising mercy that almost drips from its pages so that we can be the type of people who show mercy as our Father in heaven would. And we get this idea from Luke 6.36, where Jesus says this, Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. But before Jesus says this little line, he states this, But love your enemies and do good. And lend, expecting nothing in return, and your world will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, as your Father is merciful. The standards we are meant to show in being mercy and having mercy on others are at God's level, not ours. And they involve people we don't necessarily think should be shown mercy. Often we think when someone is needy of mercy, we think of a poor person or a kid stuck up a tree or something like that, right? Not someone who is ungrateful. Who wants to show mercy to an ungrateful person, let alone someone who is evil? But is that not what we, what we see here in Jonah as well? God showed mercy to both Jonah and Nineveh, people in the story who were revealed to be evil, it, who have done evil. If we are to show mercy then it needs to be at God's level and it will involve your enemies. Because if you were a Christian, how could you not? There was this continual comparison in the story of Jonah, wasn't there? Between Jonah and the idolaters and Jonah being comparably over and over again shown in the bad light. But God kept showing mercy on him, didn't he? And so we almost expect sometime in the book of Jonah that Jonah would at one point go, oh, I probably should show mercy just like I've shown mercy, right? It's almost ironic that he doesn't. And it wasn't for lack of clarity. Last week, we learned about the, uh, the crucial truths we need to understand God's mercy. They were to remind you, recognition that we are sinful and deserving of divine punishment. Our spiritual impotence, as in our inability to save ourselves. And number three was God saving us through extreme and costly measures. Jonah had experienced all of these as he was experiencing God's discipline drowning in the water, right? And as a result of them, he should have been humbled. He was in the same spot as the idolaters. God showed mercy to him in such an extraordinary way, and he should, too should have been able to look at them with mercy instead of running away. He reminds me of the parable that Jesus told about the unmerciful servant. The one where the servant, you know, is, is got this huge debt against his master and his master asks him to settle his debts and he can't and he begs for mercy and the master shows mercy to him. But the same forgiven servant, right? Someone else asks for money from him that uh, he asked someone else for money that's owed him and he doesn't show mercy to that person. He, he puts him in jail and everything like that. He should have shown mercy is the story there. Those who are forgiven should be able to forgive. Those who have been shown mercy should be able to show mercy. How could those who have been shown, shown so much mercy not show it in return? It's clear here that there is no, there's no excuse. But yet still, somehow, 
we find ourselves, I don't know, clinging to our self-righteousness, our arrogance, maybe our superiority, that somehow we're the better sinner than the sinner down the road. Let it not be said of us. We should show mercy. And if not because of the mercy shown to us, then surely because of how, if not because of the mercy shown to us, but surely because of the people who would be going through the judgment, for, the, for their sake at least, how could we wish hell or punishment without the hope of mercy on anyone? God was clear in Jonah 4. He looked at the Ninevites. He didn't just see them as background people, just a few thousand people he didn't care about. No, he saw people made in his image, people he made and cared for, and even animals too. And God concluded, how could he not show mercy? Jonah reminds me here of the type of Christian who talks about joy, uh, about hell with joy. Those guys who go around saying, you're going to go to hell, but they never talk about the good news. They just want to lump fire and brimstone on people. Rather than tearfully talking about it, they, they preach it with joy. How, how often have we been smeared by that behavior? We need to remember that judgment is God's strange work. He delights to show mercy. And we, out of all the sinners, should too. We should show mercy. These are the two responses I think we should have from this book. But really, the book of Jonah asks you to finish off the story. After, you all see, after, after all the things you've seen in this book, the last three or four chapters, after, all, after you've all seen, should God have showed mercy to Nineveh? That's the question you need to answer. It's not a hypothetical or theoretical question. It's an important question. Because if you say yes or no, well, there's going to be implications for that. If you say yes, then you probably should be saying, you should be showing mercy. If, you show, if you're saying no, well, maybe you need to read the book again and take a bigger look at your own situation and how you came to be where you are today. Should God have showed mercy to Nineveh? Let's pray and we'll get the music team to finish up today. Father, we, uh, we thank you that you are good and you are kind. We thank you that you are a God of mercy. Lord, I pray that you would help us to respond as we should. I pray that you would help us to be the type of people who show mercy as we have been shown. I pray that we would be the type of people who can trust you when you do show mercy. I pray that you'd instruct us today, you'd challenge us today, and you remind us of your great grace and mercy towards us who are so often...